people sing songs like the cheer Christmas is here. Merry, 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 merry Christmas. Merry, 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 merry Christmas. On a piece and all with the hand, there's a full tone to every dog. There's your cliffhanger. I hope that you'll take time to invite someone to join with you. Be here Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Bring someone with you. Let's fill this place up like this. It's an opportunity that we have, a special opportunity that we have around Christmas where people will come. And so come and invite people to come with you. Uh, one thing that we need to do right away is we're going to give you opportunity to give in a dollar blessing to help a family that uh, just because of lost time off of work needs to help catch up. And so we want to just join together as a church family. If you've got a dollar or two or five uh, that you can put toward that, we're just going to combine our money. We're going to give that to them and bless them. And uh, so just hand that down the, the row to an usher and we will uh, take care to... Get that to them and bless them. Thank you for being a church that cares for one another. A little bit goes a long way, and it's so good to be part of a, of a church family. I did want to um, correct something that Pastor Zach said. We do not have Christmas morning services. I think I heard you say that. We have Christmas Eve morning service because it's Sunday, and he's actually preaching that Sunday morning, so... Uh, we hope that you will be here Sunday morning. We have Sunday morning services, normal times, without Sunday school in between, on Christmas Eve, and then Christmas Eve service at 6 o'clock, one Christmas Eve service. So uh, mark that on your calendars. It's correct in your bulletin. Uh, I say things all the time that come out very different than I mean to say them. I hope that's not the case today. I've said some pretty embarrassing things behind the pulpit. I won't go into any of that right now. So pay attention and listen because it'll be one of those moments that if, if it happens, you'll have something to hang over my head for the rest of my life. All right. Well, we're glad that you're here and uh, honored to uh, be in the Lord's house. What an opportunity to gather together to worship. It's the first Sunday of December. We're in the Christmas season, quickly out of Thanksgiving. Uh, every day is Thanksgiving and we give thanks today for the reason for Christmas, which is Jesus. And uh, we're going to be looking in the scripture at uh, part of that narrative of Jesus coming into the world. Uh, if you want to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 2, we'll get there shortly. Uh, but since it is the first Sunday of December, I want to do a little bit of a quiz with you, just a little trivia for you to uh, test your knowledge of Christmas carols. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give, you can take out a piece of paper and write them down so that if you get them all right, you know, you'll have proof that you did that. Some of you don't really care, um, but uh, this is just kind of just to get, get the wheels turning for uh, Christmas season. But I'm going to give you a phrase from a Christmas carol, and I want you, I'm going to give you just a few seconds to, uh, to think of what the, what the song is, okay, what the title of that song is. So you ready for that? Okay, very first one is Christ is Born in Bethlehem. Christ is born in Bethlehem. What, what Christmas carol, what hymn is that from? Christ, the, uh, Christ is born in Bethlehem, and someone has given the answer to everybody else. I forgot to say, just, just wait patiently, we'll get the answer. Correct, wherever you were, okay? Everybody get that one right? How many did not know that one? Okay. Christ is born in Bethlehem. You got that one? Hark the herald angels sing. All right, number two. Here we go, now that you got the idea. I'm gonna give you a phrase. Try not to, try not to blurt it out, because this, this could be worth big, big money. Somebody may be given a reward for the best, best, uh, best uh, answers here, all right? Born the king of angels. Born the king of angels. How many got it? You got it? All right, ready? Five, four, three, two, one. What's the answer? Oh, come all you faithful. How many of you got that one? Okay. Born the king of... <laughs> you guys are horrible. <laughs> it's Christmas. It's a sing-along, okay? Some of you got that one, right? Number three, shepherds, why this jubilee? Shepherds, why this jubilee? Okay. Got it? Everybody got it? Anybody not get it? Who has that? Who has the answer? Okay, five, four, three, two, one, reveal. Angels we have heard on high. How many got that one correct? Okay, all right. 
Anybody want to sing it for us? Shepherds, why this? Oh, that's so nice. This, this, this church right over here did a fantastic job. You're, you're the designated choir, okay? Church number two, designated choir, all right. That's three. Number four, the glories of his righteousness. The glories of his righteousness. Dun, 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 dun. You got it? I can sing all kinds of other tunes, and you can stick it to any tune that you want to, and it could be totally, totally wrong. You ready? Here's the reveal. Five, four, three, two, one. Got that one? The glories of... See? You guys are catching on. This is awesome. This is what Pastor Brett does. <laughs> he gave me a thumbs down. <laughs> oh, I'm heartbroken. I'm heartbroken. I was giving you a new move. You should try that little twirl thing out sometime. It, it, it gets a, it gets a, a hand clap. Just telling you if you need a, need a little hand clapping or whatever. That's okay. You ready for the last one? Okay. Are we good? Did you already show it? Oh, you guys are ready. It's good when the tech team is ready. All right, here we go. Last one. This was the most difficult one. Now proclaim Messiah's birth. Now proclaim Messiah's birth. Someone said stairway to heaven or something like that in the first service. <laughs> Wrong answer. You got it? How many, how many have that one? Okay. All right, let's reveal. Five, four, three, two, one. Angels from the realms of glory. Now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come, come and worship. Worship Christ the newborn. I'm gonna direct this way because y'all were barely singing. All right, how many got all five of those? No one, man, you guys are honest. I was giving away $1,000 to the one who could do, yeah. <laughs> Just a little fun for Christmas. All right, let's get to the word, if you will. How many of you are in Matthew 2? Say yep. All right, here we go. We're going to read Matthew 2. As we read, I'm going to give you a little commentary. It might take us a, a few minutes to get through this, but here's, here's the thing. It's Christmas. We've got a lot of Christmas traditions. Uh, decorations, we've got those parties, presents, food, music, family, all those things are part of Christmas. A lot of traditions, but through the traditions of Christmas, are you cultivating and preserving the higher, more important traditions? And today we're going to talk about worship. We're, we're going to read this account of the, of the Magi who came for the purpose to worship the newborn king. So on your bulletin, it had, the title is, We Have Come to Worship Him. I originally titled this Christmas Worship. The slide on the front of, and the, that you're going to see on the front says, uh, The uh, Message of the Magi. So whatever title you want, those are all accurate. They all fit. Um, but today the theme is about worship. So let's start reading in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. All right? Herod. How many of you have heard of Herod before? Herod the Great. This is Herod the Great. Herod uh, the Great was known, for those who have been to Israel have seen, the colossal building projects that Herod the Great took on. There are places that you've been, if you've been in Israel, or things you've seen uh, online or in books of, of Caesarea, of Masada, Herodian, um, the expansion of the, of, the, of the temple, the Temple Mount, all part of, uh, of Herod's influence. He was uh, very much a builder, and they did everything big and, and fantastic, a lot of amazing technology for, for the time. But Herod was a very paranoid person, surrounded himself with 2,000 bodyguards. Herod ruthlessly murdered many of his own family, and uh, and was not afraid to take out someone's life if he thought they were a threat to his position uh, and his power as king. 
And then it talks about the Magi that came from the east to Jerusalem. Who were these guys? These guys, uh, might call them wise guys. Some of your translations call them wise men. Magi, depending on which translation, they're both, they're both right. Uh, it indicates that they were very smart people. Uh, they might have been astronomers, scientists of some kind. They, they had a lot of uh, abilities and talents. And tradition tells us that there were three wise men. But if you read in your Bibles, there's nothing that limits how many wise men there were. For all that we know, there could have been an entourage, like a mass amount of these people and all those that would attend them. So in my mind, there was a huge caravan of, of many wise men, okay? We get that tradition. There's three gifts. I, you know, I, none of us knows. Nothing tells us how many there were. Um, I, I did hear from someone this morning that uh, there was a fourth wise man, uh, but he didn't make it because his gift that he brought was fruitcake. So, so they said, you're out. We're just doing these three gifts, no fruitcake this time. Um, so we're not sure quite uh, what happened, how many there were, how they got this information, why they were there if an angel was sent uh, with a message about the star, or if they, if they heard about the scriptures in Numbers 24, 17, Balaam prophesied that a star would come from Jacob. We don't know the answers to that, but these wise guys appear on the scene out of nowhere. They just show up, and they're inquiring about a birth of a child. And they're looking for the one who has been born king of the Jews. Let's read on, verse 2. They asked, where is the one who has been born, king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. They've come to worship. Like I said, somehow they were notified that it was a king of kings, the king of the Jews, the Messiah had been born. And they were following a star, but it wasn't just any star. They said, we are following his star. We have seen his star and we've followed his star and we've come to worship. There's a lot of speculation about what is the star. Some have said it could be Halley's Comet or it could be a conversion of, of several planets in our, in our solar system. Uh, but modern um, astronomers say that there is absolutely no ast astronomic, or what do you call it? Ast astronomical event that, w that could be placed at this time maybe a few years before, a few years after. But what we're kind of left with is this idea that there's probably not anything that we can explain what that star is, and it's just left to be something supernatural, which really is okay, because what we have going on here, a child that is born and these, these wise men that come from so far, it's a pretty supernatural event. A new star that shows up in the sky. A baby that's born, and, and he's born in the place that Scripture prophesied hundreds of years before, that he was born there. And they show up, and guess what? He's there. Just like, just like Scripture says. This child who was born of a, of a virgin, a woman who had never known a man. There's all kinds of supernatural going on in this, in this event. And so for this star to just be explained as something supernatural is really okay. We don't have to explain where, where it came from, what it was all about, but we just know that it was a supernatural phenomenon, maybe a once in history kind of a thing, and these wise men saw it and they followed it and it led them eventually uh, to this child. So they haven't got there quite yet, but verse three says, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. There's a phrase, you've, you, you know it, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, right? And I think that, that that kind of applies here with Herod. You know, Herod, um, Herod uh, was upset, and they know when Herod's upset, uh, bad things happen. And so, um, why was he upset? Like I said, he, he suffered with paranoia, and, and he was extremely paranoid. If they, these guys show up asking where the king of the Jews was born, and he's going, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm king of the Jews. What are you talking about, uh? king of the Jews is born. And so all of a sudden, you know, his, his antennas perk up and he's going, I'm going to find out who this king of the Jews is and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have it out. So um, verse 4, he called together the chief priests and the teachers of the law and asked them, where was the Messiah to be born? 
Herod wasn't real familiar with scripture, so he goes and finds some of the, uh, the, 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 the priests, the teachers of the law, and he finds out, okay, what, what's the story? There's a Messiah that's going to be born. Where's, where is he from? Verse 5, uh, they respond, uh, in Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Okay? They say Bethlehem. And they are referring to a scripture that was, that was given uh, by Micah 700 years earlier, one of the minor prophets. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 is where that verse came from. And um, um, Bethlehem, if you're, if you're not familiar, just six miles from Jerusalem. Six miles almost straight south of, of Jerusalem is Bethlehem. Uh, you can almost literally see uh, one from the other if you're there from, uh, depending on your vantage point in Jerusalem to, to Bethlehem. They're that close. Uh, but, but it was prophesied that he would come from the tribe of Judah. That's where the Messiah would be born. Uh, read on verse 7. Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem. And he said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go. I too may go and worship him. So what was Herod doing here? Did he have an interest in worshiping this king? Absolutely not. He knew um, this was a trick. He said, you go find out. You come back to me so that he would know the whereabouts of the baby. He was scheming a plan from the beginning to find out where the Messiah was, where he was born, so that he could have this, this baby killed. Later on in this chapter, we find out the Magi didn't come back to tell Herod uh, where, where they found him because uh, they were visited with a dream that said, uh, don't go back to Herod, go, go back home and take another route. It was all part of a, a supernatural plan that was going on here. Um, and when they didn't return, Herod discovered it, and uh, the plan from that point is... Uh, he had an edict to kill all the male children two years old and under. It's a pretty, pretty drastic plan. Uh, verse 9, the star that they had seen when it arose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And verse 10 says, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Their journey had ended successfully, and they were about to meet the reason that their journey began in the first place. What was the reason that they were journeying? To worship God this baby that was born king of the Jews. Verse 11 says, coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. You see, Jesus, uh, Joseph, and Mary, they were still in Bethlehem. It's where Jesus was born. This is not the time of the, of the nativity when we see everything together. We know that the, these uh, wise men showed up a little bit later. And um, so they were still in Bethlehem. Uh, they were living in a house. Remember in the, in the birth of Jesus, there was no place for them. They were, they were traveling to Bethlehem. There was no place for them. Well, they're still in Bethlehem, and it says that they're, 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 they're in a house because on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down to worship him. And notice that it says that he is a child. The child was there with, with Mary and Joseph. Different word than the word would be for a baby. A baby would be brephos. A child would be paideon. Okay, and here it's Pideon. So he, he's not just an infant, he's grown a little bit. So whether that's a few months, a couple of years, we don't know. Um, but but there's, there's the story, and it says in verse 12, having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, these wise men returned to their country by another route. So what I want us to talk about for the next few moments is this idea of worship. The word worship we actually read three times in this passage. And I want to talk about what we can learn about these wise men and how it relates to worship on our part. The first thing I want you to see is to worship Jesus, we have to risk the journey. We risk the journey. These magi came searching for the Messiah. Just a second. They left their families. They left everything that was familiar to them. And they made a journey that in those days would have been very long and dangerous. So it's estimated there's several hundred miles, possibly a thousand, up to 1,500 miles. We don't even know exactly where they came from, but they came from the east. And at, uh, traveling a thousand, 1,500 miles, at most traveling 40 
40 miles a day, probably 20, 30, depending on the train and the weather and all of that kind of stuff, you, you realize that that adds up to many days, weeks, and possibly a few months of a journey. So they left all those things and they risked it. And why would they risk such a dangerous journey, such a dangerous trip? What was the purpose of their trip? We saw his star in the east and we have come to worship. The sole purpose of this journey was to come and worship this king of the Jews, this baby that is born. We hear stories from missionaries in underdeveloped countries uh, of people who will walk miles uh, for water. Uh, people who will walk miles to come to a very simple structure so that they can have corporate worship together as, as believers. And we've had several missionaries over the past few months uh, from that, that, that minister in China of the underground church that meets in people's homes or apartments, and they do so at, at great risk because they're not, they're not certain that you know, the possibility exists that as they're meeting in a, in a home church uh, that uh, one of the authorities could, could come through the door, arrest who's ever in there, and possibly, possibly torture them. We've heard stories of that. So as we, as we talk about the risk of the journey, I want you to think about uh, us as Americans, the American churchgoer, and what we risk to worship Jesus. You see, we actually have people in our church, people here in this service right now, who uh, drive over 80 miles to come to church. Did you know that? There's a number of people sitting in the room right now that have driven 30, 40, 50, 60 miles to come to church. It's pretty, pretty amazing. There's a, there's a much more of a journey than my mile point three that I drove to church. And I'd say most of us, probably five to 10, maybe uh, just a few blocks. So we talk about coming to church in that context, and, and how did we get here? We drove in, in, uh, in automobiles that are, uh, that are heated. They have heat or air conditioned if it's, if it's hot out. Uh, we come to a building where uh, it's, it's heated, and you've got relatively nice seats to sit in. It's not like your recliner at home but we don't want you to go to sleep any more than, we're already putting you to sleep, so you know, there's gotta be a, a certain level of comfort that we've gotta keep it. But it's a nice place to come worship. What are we risking and what are we sacrificing by coming here today? Not a lot. And so with all these comforts and with all these things that we've got here, and there's some who just come once, maybe twice a month. Where's the risk in the journey? We don't have a lot of physical risk, but I want to pro propose to you this morning that the real, true, genuine worship involves spiritual risk, and a ton of it. Because when you really seek Jesus and when you really worship him with your heart and with your life, you know what he's going to do. Do you? Jesus offered his life. We sang it in a song this morning. Jesus paid it all. He paid everything for you. Our response to him is, what do we owe? All. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. I wrote down a lyric in one of the verses. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. It's because of what he's done, there should be worship in our heart and a response of gratitude and thankfulness for him, for what he's done. What he wants is all of us. He gave his life and he wants us to offer our lives, not just part of it. He calls us and asks us to deny ourselves, take up a cross, and follow him. Um, even if it means le leaving your comfort, even if it means leaving your income or your hobbies, even leaving your secret little sins that nobody else talks about, he wants you to give him everything to go all in. And so this journey to become a worshiper of Jesus uh, is incredibly risky, 
but the journey is worth it. Jesus said, I assure you, this is Mark 10, 29, I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property. That's a pretty good return. Listen, if you know anything about investments, if you, if you knew you were gonna get a hundred-fold return on your money, how many of you are in on that? Like you could give a hundred, and it comes back as 10,000. This is a pretty good deal. He's saying, look, you, you, you need to risk everything. You go all in and you give up your life. But he's saying, when you do that, I promise that it's gonna come back to you with a hundred times the blessing but he also adds on a little tag to that, along with persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. So Jesus assured his followers that uh, whoever gives up something valuable for his sake is gonna be repaid. He's gonna take care of us. He's got our back, he's watching out for us. Um, maybe it's not gonna come back necessarily in the same form, but he said, look, I've got you. I will take care of you. But with these rewards, he says, comes persecution. Persecution is not something that we're really familiar with, and it's not something that we probably really want to sign up for. But why does he say that you'll be persecuted? The world that we live in doesn't like Jesus. Live through Christmas here. Jesus gets slammed a lot. We like Christmas, we like buying things and giving gifts, but talk about Jesus. You know, there was a time a few years ago we made buttons that said, it's okay to, it's okay to tell me Merry Christmas. You remember those? Uh, Jesus is the reason for Christmas, those types of things. It's, it's not, I mean, when you go to a store and they say, Happy Holidays. Wah, wah, wah. It's Christmas. Christmas is Jesus. But we don't, the world doesn't like God. They hate God. And he said, look, they hated me, they'll hate you too. So, he's not looking for, um, not looking for fair, weather, fair weather followers or people who are ready to jump on the Jesus bandwagon, but he's looking for people who have counted the cost, who understand who Jesus really is and what he offers those um, who put their life, their faith, their trust in him. And so this Christmas, I challenge you to, to get past all the, the glitz and the glamour of Christmas, the presents, the parties, and become a genuine, true worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm asking you to just to go all in. Not, not play around on the edges, but to, but to jump in. All in, head first. Matthew S. has a song called All In. He's like, head, all in the deep end, head first. I mean, just jump in. What's holding you back? Risk the journey, it'll be worth it. The second thing to worship Jesus, we have to know the word. So we're not, under, we're not 100% certain how these wise men got the information that they got that sent them on this journey, but for some reason, they were following this phenomena, this once in a lifetime star that appeared. And they knew somehow that it would lead uh, to a newborn king. Herod uh, obviously didn't know the scriptures well. He had to call on the priest, like I said, uh, just to tell them where the Messiah would be born. But even though these guys didn't know much about the word of God, the word of God wasn't silent. It was right there the whole time. It was testifying to the Messiah. Not only the location, but the purpose of his birth. And my, my, my point is this, is that the word is here for us to discover. The word is here. We have the word of God. We don't have to guess what it says. You can, you can talk to people who are smarter than you, but you can dig in and find out yourself. It's available to all of us. It's here for us to discover, to learn, to study, to memorize, meditate. That's what scripture says we need to do. You see, we, we memorize a lot of useless information. We've got, how many of us have song lyrics stuck in our head from 30 years ago? Song comes on the radio you haven't heard for that long and the, the whole line of lyrics, you've got them. How many have experienced that? Okay, we learn song lyrics. We learn lines to movies, right? We watch, we watch TV. We, um, we watch movies. We spend hours on the internet we, and social media. We do recreational things, activities with our kids. 
So much so that the word of God has gotten pushed aside in our lives. And I'm telling you, uh, common sense tells me that our lives are so busy that unless we're scheduling that into our time, into our day, for God, for his word, and for worship, it's not happening. Most of us already live with this philosophy and perspective that there's not enough time in the day. How many of you have said that before? That's the way we live our life. There's all kinds of things that we need to do, all kinds of things that we can spend our time with. And so it's not hard to understand that if we're not making a point for these things to happen, it's not going to happen. Is that true? Just looking at your own life and your own experience. If, it, it, does, you, does your time with God and, and worship every day and time in the Word, is it just something that naturally happens and you've just got, oh, like just time that just shows up and you go, it's work. You have to make it a point, just like everything else in our life. Carve out some time. The lack of the word in our daily lives is obvious when we gather together on a day like this for, for corporate worship. Too often our, our worship becomes casual, half-hearted, and routine. We're singing lyrics that are life-changing lyrics. I don't care if you like the tune, the, the words are, are awesome or else we don't sing it. And we have an opportunity to, to come together and worship. This isn't our only time to worship. You should be worshiping on your own. But this is a time when we gather together with other people of like mind and like spirits and we can come together and lift our worship together, but we don't do that. It's, it's tough. You come up here and just watch how people respond to worship. And I'm just talking about, you know, lifting corporate worship together. We get in the habit of let's just do church, you know. We get in the habit of just showing up to see what songs are being sung, to see if we like those, see if I like who's preaching, see if that guy can tell me anything that I don't already know. I'm not saying you showed up with all of that going on. But if we're not, if we're not intentional in our coming together to worship, that's what we're doing. We're just spectating. We're just watching. It's like watching a movie, watching a show. And I'm telling you, if the word of God and the fullness of his spirit is fresh in our lives, that we can't help but pour out our hearts in worship when we come together. David in Psalm 122 said, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Why was he so excited? There's a lot of things I'm sure that were going on. Why he was so excited to go to the house of the Lord. But I asked you this question this morning. Were you glad to come this morning? Was, was the words of your heart in your mind today, I am so excited to get to church? Or is it just because it's Sunday? It's what we do. It's our Sunday thing. I challenge you. to get past our casual indifference to the word of God and to make time to read it, to study it, to cultivate, to renew its, its place in your life and your love for the word and become a, a mature worshiper. I, I promise you that it's worth the effort. Let's do that. Number three, to worship Jesus, we must come with sacrifice and generosity. The Magi's journey, it ended successfully. Verse 10 says that they were filled with joy. They were overjoyed. I want to say this, that all paths that lead to Jesus end in joy. If you are pursuing Jesus, I promise you that that, that road, that path that's leading you to Jesus will always end in joy. That's part of his nature. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. It's number two on the list. All paths that lead you to Jesus are going to end in joy. You won't be disappointed. It says that they entered the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped. These guys were thrilled to get to this place and to fall on their knees and to worship Jesus. Why? 
What's the big deal? What's the point of their journey in the first place? They risked a lot. They'd paid a a huge price. They'd persevered. They'd sacrificed. And this was their reward. They made it. They got there and they did exactly what they planned and intended to do. They worshiped Jesus. They brought gifts and pretty expensive ones at that. That's why the fruitcake got kicked out. Some would say it's a pretty extravagant gift to bring a little boy. But the truth is that there's not a gift that's too extravagant for Jesus. You giving your all is a pretty extravagant thing. But he's worth it. What kind of gifts do you bring to Jesus? What do your gifts to Jesus look like? Do you bring him the first fruits? See, scripture over and over talks about first fruits, bringing the first of what you get, the top of everything that you have, the best of what you have. And what he requires is, is, is a tenth. Pastor Zach alluded to that. It's like, that, it's, if we look at it, it's all, all God's money. He, he just asks for a portion of it and lets us have the rest of it. Where do we get the abilities and the, 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 the ways that we can make money in the first place? We can't take credit for any of that. God's in control of it all. So what are our gifts to Jesus? Do we bring him the the first fruits that he requires or do we just give him leftovers? I I love leftovers. Like I'm talking food, turkey, Thanksgiving. It doesn't matter what what meal it is. You know, it's the next day, it's getting close to lunchtime and I'm thinking what's in the refrigerator, what did we have last night? Because I'm going home and making some leftovers. How many of you love leftovers? doesn't matter what it is. Most of the time, leftovers taste better to me anyway. It's just better, okay? But God doesn't want leftovers. He doesn't want your leftovers. Take time this week, if you will, to read uh, the book of Malachi. It's in the Old Testament. It's one of the Old Testament prophets. And I want you to read through that book, and I want you just to ask the Holy Spirit, what do you want me to take from this? What do you want me to hear? and just respond accordingly. Listen to the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Sacrifice and generosity are trademarks of true worshipers. I wanna wanna close by just making a few observations and comments on the Magi's worship. One is this, the Magi, they, they came desiring genuine worship. Worship is really just paying tribute. It's an expression of reverence and adoration to regard as great or extravagant respect for someone, honor and devotion. And so these, these magi understood that in this momentous uh, occasion, which they traveled several hundred miles for, they came just to be there and worship. Genuine worship to them meant sacrifice and humility. These men were, were educated. They were well-respected in their community. They, and here they are bowing before a little child. Is there a better example of genuine worship? Here's the deal. All of us, all of us worship something. It might be your, your home, your vehicle, your fishing boat, your family, sports team something recreational, but for true followers of Jesus, worshiping God is number one. It's the priority. Anything above that is an idol in our lives. Anything that takes the place of God. As Christians, as true followers and worshipers of Jesus, he takes the number one spot. He's the priority. And we need to realign our thinking as to what worship really is. It's acknowledging the lordship of Christ in and over our lives. Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. He's my commander. He's my director. He gives orders and I do what he says. A true follower. They, they desired genuine worship and they came prepared for worship. They came prepared to worship Messiah. Verse 11, they came bearing gifts from their homeland. They were 
physically prepared for their meeting with Jesus, but they were also spiritually prepared. They knew that the star represented the birth of a king of the Jews. And my guess is that each day of their journey, they weren't sure where they were gonna end up. They just knew that they were on a journey and it was leading somewhere and it was gonna lead to the king of the Jews. But I'm sure each day in their journey as they got closer and closer, the anticipation, the excitement started to build. I know uh, when we went to Montana for Thanksgiving, that long, laborious drive across South Dakota, until you get to the Black Hills, there's a little bit of a reprieve there. And then you get past that and it's kind of yuck again for a little while, but then all of a sudden the mountains crop up on the horizon and you realize I'm getting closer. And there's just something about the journey and a long journey and getting closer to that that you're anticipating what I came here for. So they were increasingly excited about this coming uh, worship service that they were gonna have. It's the preparation that's vital for any endeavor. You look on a can of paint and it's gonna tell you to prepare the surface for what you're gonna paint, right? If you paint something and it's all dirty and dusty, that paint job is not gonna work. If the paint's flaking off, uh, it, it's not, you're not gonna get a great paint job painting over flaked paint, okay? You've got to prepare the surface uh, for the paint to really work. It's just, preparation is, is imperative for us in worship too. I want you to think how our Sunday services would be different. How would our Sunday services be different if we prepared for this moment. How many of you spent time in your week preparing, saying, I know I'm gonna come together to worship and, I, and I'm gonna prepare myself? Or do we just kinda, kinda show up? I wanna challenge you to, uh, this week, my, why wait? This Saturday, if, I wonder how many of you would commit to pray in 30 minutes on Saturday, Saturday evening, whenever, sometime on Saturday, just praying to prepare yourself. And for those that are sitting around you for next week's worship, how much different do you think it would be? How many of you would say, I'll do that? I'm in. Let's try it and see. See what happens. Come prepared, expecting great things to happen, and it will. The Magi came with a, with a single purpose. Last point, if the musicians would come. They came to Jerusalem. They, they, the Magi, they didn't say, well, we just happened to be passing through, and we decided to stop by. Since we're in the area, we just stop by and see Jesus. It wasn't anything like that. They weren't on a journey to nowhere and just thought, hey, we're in the neighborhood, we'll just stop by and see if we can see Jesus. They declared emphatically that the driving force that compelled them was we have come to worship him. Worship is what drove them. We ought to come to worship with one purpose and that's not to be entertained. This is not about entertainment. You know, because we have a set here, we don't have a lot of instruments. We've got, if you notice today, we've got three, three acoustic guitars, a, a, a wood box. You know, it's, they're, they're not the things that we're used to. The sound is a little bit different. But you know what, we don't even need, wor we don't even need instruments up here to worship. These guys don't go with you home. These people don't go home with you and worship for you. You're expected to do that on your own, right? It's homework. I love the fact that we, that we get a chance to do this and change it up a little bit because you know what? Worship isn't about the, the band. It's not about an instrument. It's about us. It's about us connecting with our God. We come with a single purpose of meeting with God and allowing him to change and transform our lives. That's what we're here for today. And my prayer is that he would do that. You know, it's Christmas and we give gifts to our loved ones at Christmas. You've been, you've been out shopping, you've been out looking, uh, trying to get the deals this last week. We had Black Friday, we had Cyber Monday, we had Cyber Week. Uh, too bad you missed all that. 
if you didn't get anything, it's, we're back to paying full price, I guess. I don't know. But we're in that season of getting gifts and giving gifts to one another. Some people actually believe that the practice of giving gifts came from these magi who brought gifts to the, to the baby Jesus. But the real reason for giving, the real sacrifice, the real generosity wasn't by the magi. It was God the Father. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever perish, whoever believe in him wouldn't perish, but have eternal life. That's what he did for you. That's the purpose that Jesus came as a baby. Would you stand with me this morning? This morning, I want to invite you to respond either to this, this, this verse, that God so loved you that he gave his one and only son, that if you just believe in him, you have eternal life. The alternative is that you perish. Would you respond to Jesus?